Well, good morning. Welcome to Chelton. We are gathered in the name of the Lord. We say thanks be to God because he's made us the body of Christ. And so as the body of Christ, we know that when, when one part suffers, uh, we all suffer. So I thought it would be very appropriate that we start the worship service off uh, this morning reading a, a psalm of lament. Uh, because it's, it's important for us to practice being sad about the things that are sad in our own lives. And it's also important for us to practice being sad for one another. Because when one part suffers, we all suffer. So sit with this as I read this passage of Scripture. And then after I finish reading, I'm going to, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to ask the Spirit to lead us into the hope that we have in Christ. Because we never just stay here. And we are the people of a risen King who lament for a while. And then we move into hope because Christ is risen. So this is your call to worship from Psalm 137. By the waters of Babylon, where we sat down and wept, when we remembered Zion, on the willows there we hung all of our lyres, and there our captors required of us songs, and our tormentors mirth, saying, Sing us one of your songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. So Lord, we, we come to you in sad situations, in hard and desperate situations. And some of us are better than others and so we pray that you would show us how to weep with those who weep and to mourn with those who mourn and to rejoice with those who rejoice because we are all in this together. And forgive us when we behave in any other way. And guide us today as we worship you now in your spirit. Guide us into joy. Guide us into the joy of our salvation found in Christ. We pray all of these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, life everlasting. Amen. So now we have to sing. So let's sing together. Dead of 
church. Thanks for joining us this morning. If you're a guest with us and not a regular part of our church family, an extra special welcome to you this morning. We love you. And we are so thankful you've joined us. And if there's any way that we can bless you, serve you, and pray with you, please reach out to us and let us know. We'd be honored to do that. I don't know about you, but I'm very eager to gather again together for worship. Not exactly sure when that'll be, but I'm really excited for it whenever it comes. In preparation for that day, again, not knowing when that day will be, but in preparation for that, we have created at Shelton a reopening task force, as we've called it. There's a group of staff and volunteers who are proactively working to put together a plan, actually several plans, to figure out what it might look like for us to reopen our in-person worship services. We would greatly appreciate your prayers for that. It's a very complicated and complex situation. Uh, it's always changing, but we want to continue as a church to submit to the governing authorities placed over us with a spirit of joyful joyfulness. We want to submit joyfully. We also want to love our neighbors well when we consider about reopening. And we really just want to be together again. So please pray for us as we work through those plans. And even though we cannot gather in person, we can come together in prayer, which is why this Saturday, May 23rd, at 1 p.m., you are invited, as part of the larger body of Shelton scattered throughout various neighborhoods, to prayer walk through your own neighborhood at the same time as the rest of the Shelton family. We will pray as one at one for our neighbors, healthcare workers, leaders, businesses, and all those impacted by COVID-19. There will be more information coming out in this Wednesday's midweek update, so please look out for that email uh, and, and save the date and plan to join us on Saturday at 1 o'clock. Well, we're very excited this morning to have Pastor Jin Hyo Lee back with us this morning. Kids, Miss Mary did a special Get to Know Pastor Jin video just for you, giving you all the important answers to your questions like what's Jin's favorite color, what's his favorite food, and much more. That, e that video is in the email that your parents got, uh, so make sure you check that out later on today. Well, in just a few minutes, we're excited to have Pastor Jin back preaching again to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as part of our new sermon series, God's New Community. We'll be discovering what it means for us to be the body of Christ. This will be Jin's second sermon with us, which will fulfill the final requirement in our constitution and bylaws prior to membership vote which will take place at our annual business meeting. As you've been hearing for the last couple of weeks, that annual business meeting will be taking place virtually uh, via Zoom webinar on Saturday, May 31st at 6 p.m. A email will be coming out later this afternoon to the entire Chelton family with a lot of important information about the upcoming business meeting. In it, you'll find a video 
please watch that video first because this video will introduce all of the documents that are included in that email. These are the same documents that in previous years would be out in the lobby on a table for you to grab. This video will also introduce the main items for our business meeting and what we need to vote on as a church family. This year's meeting has a lot of important things that we're going to be voting on. We'll be including electing church leaders, voting on a proposed budget for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. We'll be approving Pastor Neal's transition off of the pastoral leadership team and into the role of other senior of other pastor. We'll be voting on the promotion of John Shepherd to the pastoral leadership team and voting on the hiring of Reverend Dr. Jin Hyo Lee as one of our senior pastors on the PLT. And if by tomorrow morning you do not receive this email, go check your spam folders, a good chance it got thrown in there. But if it's not in your spam folder and you've not received it, please contact the church office. We'd love to resolve that problem with you. And so Chelton members, please make every effort to attend and participate in this year's virtual business meeting. The good news is you don't even have to leave your own house to vote and to be a part of the meeting. Parents, no need for babysitters. In fact, you have full permission to put on a movie or a show so that you and your spouse can both participate in this year's meeting. That's what we'll be doing at the Shepherd family for sure. So we hope that you're able to join us during that.
Hi, church family. Let's pray. Father, in this time of social isolation and separation, in a time where connecting looks like hopping onto Zoom or making a FaceTime call, we look forward to the day when we will gather again. And as we wait patiently and hopefully, we thank you for the unity found in you, in being your children. I pray that you would make us a people who seek and pursue unity despite every barrier that threatens to cause division. Things like racism, sexism, political views, distance, envy, and a million other things that we may encounter each day. We pray as the church that the way we love in this time will be a light to the world that is starving for love and desperate for hope. We pray that in this time of social separation, your church would be more united than ever. We pray for unity of your people throughout every neighborhood and every nation. Lord, would you burden our hearts for our brothers and sisters around the world, that we would pray fervently for our brothers and sisters across the globe with all the passion and love as if they were the brothers and sisters in our own homes. May we be reminded of Ephesians 2, verses 13 through 14, which reads, But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. We praise you for your grace, for your unrelenting love that makes us, who were once aliens and foreigners, part of your family. May we embrace one another with the same openness, knowing we are one body with many members. We praise you for your divine purposes and your almighty ways. Be with us and make us salt and light, a people who bring a taste of the kingdom of God everywhere we go. We pray all of these things in your holy and almighty name. Amen. A person's body is one thing, but it has many parts. Yeah, there are many parts to a body, but all those parts make only mm, one body. Christ is like that too, but we were all baptized into one body through one spirit, and we were all made to share in the one spirit. So like we said, a person's body has more than one part. It has many parts. The foot might say, I'm not a hand, so I'm not part of the body. But saying this would not stop the foot from being part of the body. The ear might say, I am not an eye, so I am not part of the body. Saying this would not make the ear stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, the body would not be able to hear. You mean we couldn't hear music or funny jokes? Exactly. And if the whole body were an ear, the body would not be able to smell anything. Wait, wait, wait. You mean like cookies, flowers, nothing? You got it. Nothing. <gasps> if each part of the body were the same part, there would be nobody. God put the parts in the body as he wanted them. He made a place for each one of them. And so there are many parts, but only one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the foot, uh, hey mate, uh, I don't need you. No! Those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are really very, very important. God did not want our body to be divided. God wanted the different parts to care the same for each other. If one part of the body suffers, then all the other parts suffer with it. Or if one part of our body is honored, then all the other parts share its honor. All of you together are the body of Christ. Each one of you is a part of the body. Hello 
Chelton. It's great to be with you once again this morning. For the past few Sundays, we have been talking about our new sermon series, Church, God's New Community. So Bill walked us through the overview about our series on God's new community. And last Sunday, Sheb brought us to the foundation of it all, Jesus Christ, the head of the church. And today's passage will bring us to perhaps one of the most familiar metaphors when it comes down to church, church being the body of Christ. Now the question is then, is the church being the body of Christ just an intellectual concept or does it have some life altering implications? I think Apostle Paul argues for the latter. I believe Word of God is powerful enough to transform the way we live our lives. So I hope and pray that today's word will speak to you. Today's word is found from 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 26. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 26. It's rather a long passage, but I'm going to read in its entirety. Verse 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we are all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Greek, slave or free. And we are all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Verse 15. Now, if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. It would not, for that reason, stop being part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has placed every part in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. Verse 25, so that there should be no division in the body, but that each part should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Four things we learn from today's passage. First, we are the body of Christ. Verse 12 to 14. Second, the body of Christ needs me, verse 15 to 20. Third, I need the body of Christ, verse 21 to 24. Lastly, fourth, we are all in this together, verse 25 to 26. So this is a very natural flow of logic in Paul's mind. We are the body of Christ, and the body of Christ needs me, and I need the rest of the body of Christ, and we are all in this together. So as you go along, I'll sprinkle some implications, but let's dive in together. First point, we are the body of Christ, verse 12 to 14. Now, here Paul likens the church with the body, a human body. Sometimes when we repeat the same metaphors over and over, we lose its significance. But when you take a time to think about it, human body is by far one of the most organic creation of God. I don't know whether we have biologists among our body in Shelton, 
our human body is marvelously complex and yet unified with unparalleled harmony with interrelatedness. It's a unit, it all works together as one. If my finger gets cut off, it's not like finger runs on its own, it dies and the rest of the body loses some of its function and effectiveness as a result of loss. In other words, the body is more than just a mechanical sum of its part. It has life in it. It has so much more. What's the implication of this passage? First, the church is not only an organization, but it's an organism. In other words, it's not the same as any other organization you attend to. It's an organism that has life in it. It's alive and active. It's life transforming. It's more than an organization. See, Chelton, I will. I will attend your children's soccer game. And I'll watch the Eagles game with you. Fly, Eagle, fly. I'll cheerfully cheer for Eagles. That being said, Church is far more than NFL organization because it's an organism. It's a life. In other words, church should not just be a minor part of your life, but it should be the center of who you are. You cannot go anywhere without your body. Your body goes with you. You cannot separate yourself with your body. It's a life. It's who you are. And that's the church that Paul here likens to, a human body. Meaning the church should take priority and preeminence in all the other activities, all the other organization. It requires your entire commitment. You are in this together because it's a body, a living, active organism. Second implication that we can learn from this passage. For we are all baptized by one spirit as to form one body. That's what Paul says in verse 13. What does that mean? It is the spirit of God who brought you here. Cheltonite, if you call Chelton as your home church, you are not here by accident. It is the Spirit of God who brought you here to specifically fulfill the mission of God for the glory of God and for the edification of the body. See, I hear this all the time. When I hear marriage, I hear that people say, God brings one man and one woman together for the glory of God. God ordains marriage. Do you realize that God ordains the church too? If Chelton's your home, the friends you have in Chelton are not here by accident. It's not they are here gathered by accident, but out of billions of people in the world, God has brought this specific few hundred people together for the glory of God. It's a unit, it's a body, it has great interrelatedness. There is just something about church. The spiritual friendship we get to form within the church is God designed, spirit ordained. That's what Paul is saying here in verse 13, that by one spirit, we are forming one body. Yes, Chelton, you are right in saying that you are saved alone. That's right. It is when you put your trust in Jesus Christ that God saved you based on by his grace and through your faith. However, God has saved you alone, but he has never saved you for you to remain alone. That means you should commit to the body of Christ. It's an organism. It's a life. You cannot just go on doing your own thing. Charlton, in a church, there is no such thing as flying incognito. We all are accountable for one another. Do you know that the Spirit of God has brought you to this body? Paul had such a high view of church, doesn't it? Next, let's move on. So first of point was that Paul said, we are the body of Christ. Second, and the body of Christ needs me. Here, Paul says in verse 15, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. And if the fear says, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. And Paul says in verse 18, no, 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 stop. Being who you are is okay. What does Paul say? But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. 
meaning only you can be you, only I can be I. The body of Christ needs me just as I am. It's absolutely okay to be who you are, Chelton. You are fearfully, wonderfully designed and made by God. And He has strategically placed you in the body of believers. For you, only you can fulfill the certain mission of God that God has called you to be. In other words, we have no desire. We shouldn't go about saying, man, I wish I can be somebody else. No, when we lose you, our body lose big part of who we are because only you can be who you are. See, I dare you, none of you got up this morning thinking, man, praise God for my earlobe. This is just incredible, so soft. Or like, man, I'm so thankful for my middle toe. My middle toe just works so flawlessly. If you got up really thinking that, you're weird. I'm a little worried about you. None of you got up saying, man, I am so thankful for my elbow. No, none of you did that. Why? Because our God has designed a certain part of the body to just fulfill its mission without constantly demanding your attention. It's silently doing the job that God has designed to be. When do you notice your middle toe or elbow? Only when it's broken, right? It hurts. It screams your attention. It works very similar as your ego. Your broken ego will continually and constantly demand your attention, doing endless comparison, wanting to be somebody else, wanting to be something else. No, what God has called us to do is be who you are. The body of Christ needs me just as I am. So let us do the job that God has called us to do without doing endless comparison caused by utter self-absorption. Our broken ego constantly demands attention to ourselves. And Paul is saying, stop, you are here just as you are and it's okay to be you, who you are because we need you just as you are. So first, we are the body of Christ. The body of Christ needs me and third, I need the rest of the body of Christ. Look verse 21. It says, The eye, I cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. No, we cannot say that. We need one another. We are desperately in need of one another more than we realize. And what does Paul encourage us to do? especially to those parts who are maybe less visible. What does 23, 24 Paul says here? In the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with a special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with a special modesty. Now here, Paul is talking about spiritual gift in chapter 12 and also 13. One thing very important for all of us to understand is that in Paul's mind, there's difference between spiritual gifts and spiritual fruit. Sometimes we equate that those two and make great mistakes. Now here, Paul says we need to give more attention to those who may not be most visible in the body. Why is that? Here's the reason. When we equate spiritual gift and spiritual fruit, when we mistake that, it causes great confusion. See, spiritual gifts are what you do, while spiritual fruit are what you are. In other words, sometimes you mistakenly equate your spiritual gift as if spiritual maturity, spiritual fruit. In other words, if you have more prominent gift, sometimes you might mistakenly thinking you are far more mature. No, gifts are what you do. Spiritual fruit are your spiritual maturity. Are you gentle? Are you kind? Is there self-control? Is there joy? Is there peace within you? But what is so dangerous about equating spiritual gift as if spiritual maturity is that then more visible gifts are much honored while less visible gifts are not noticed, not recognized as if they are not mature believers in Christ. See, I have to keep my own heart very short leash. Do you know what's the danger of more prominent gift? See, gift can still operate even you may be far from God. 
Let's say because I can speak the words from the Lord and I say people are saved. So all of a sudden I'm thinking, oh wow, God may be very pleased with me. People are getting saved. And I'm mistakenly thinking I'm more mature than others. No, God forbid. It is the Spirit of God who works in people's heart to save the sinners to Himself. God can still use the sinners, but it is the Spirit of God. See, J.I. Packer once said about Charles Spurgeon, the great preachers, J.I. Packer said, if Charles Spurgeon did not become a preacher, he would have become a prime minister. He was that eloquent. Maybe some of you guys are very prime on gift of leadership and you think, oh wow, people are very edified by it. As a result, God must be very pleased with me. I may be very spiritual mature. While your personal life, your private life, you do not bear any spiritual fruit and your time with the Lord is in great jeopardy. Check your heart today. This really made sense to me, Shelton, when I saw many prominent pastors fall from ministry. Your gift of leadership, very charismatic gift, visible gift, can still very well operate. That's not spiritual maturity. See, maybe some of you have great gifts of, let's say, singing. You might still be able to sing beautifully and people may still be edified by it while your personal life do not walk with the Lord. Check your heart. People might praise you thinking you are very godly. People might praise me thinking I may be very godly. But how do we spend our time with the Lord? Are we just continually condescending others who are less visible thinking we are more mature? Paul says, no way. Give greater honor to those who might not have most visible gift. Now, those of you who might not have most visible gifts, we see you, Paul sees you, Jesus Christ sees you. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. If you're bearing spiritual fruit of gentleness, forbearance, kindness, you are pleased, you are known, you are loved in the sight of the Lord just as you are. You don't have to be somebody else. We are so thankful for your faithful presence. Don't be mistakenly thinking that you are less mature because you not you do not have less you do not have more visible gifts. Sometimes gifts can masquerade as if it's fruit, but it's not. So we want to take time to thank you for your faithful presence. No matter what you do, we are so much less without you. Actually, I can really say that from the deep down of my heart, because when I was a youth, I think I shared it once before to some of you during meet and greet, I grew up in a small town country church. There were only four of us youth group out in a middle school, but there was a one college student from our church that he took four hours of bus ride every weekend to come down from his college to small town country church just to be with us. Was he the best speaker? Not really. Was he so charismatic leader? No, he was so quiet and soft spoken that sometimes it was even hard to hear him. But every weekend he was there for me and three other students. And every time I saw him, it was a living representation of God's faithfulness in my life. So he walked with me in this season of growing up. And down the road, when I, a few years ago, when I told him that, hey, I'm going to be in ministry. I'm getting ordained in a few years later. He was like, oh, wow, are you serious? Are you walking through the process? And I told him, yeah. And he took me to this shop. He's like, Jen, I just want to do something for you. Now, this guy was not the rich guy, just like his own character, very humble guy. He became a public school teacher in a very rural that nobody knows, this small town for the special needs children. And he loves Jesus. He just wants to spend time with those who are outcast and marginalized. And I have utmost respect for him. So he didn't have much money. But he bought me this nice suit and told me, Jen, if you're going to be a pastor, especially on your ordination day, you can wear this. And I was so moved by that. After he bought me that suit, I did not wear that for one year because first time I wear the suit, I wanted that to be my ordination day. So on my ordination day in 2012, I'm kneeling down crying. What I'm thinking of? 
God, you are calling this prodigal and I'm thinking of this friend of mine who was there for me, who took four hours of bus ride every weekend just to be with me because he believed in me. He was faithful presence. Was he, did he have most visible charismatic gift? No, but he was so faithful and my life has been transformed by his presence. Chelton, you are needed just as you are. And those of you with more visible gift, you need one another. We still need others. We lose our function apart from having one another. That's what Paul is calling us to be. And where does Paul logic lead us to? Look verse 25 and 26. So that there should be no division in the body, but that each part should have equal concern for each other. Verse 26. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. See, it's very logical flow. We are the body of Christ. Body of Christ needs me and I need the rest of the body. And we are all in this together. If one suffer, we all suffer. If one honored, we are all honored. What is the mark of this community? See, Chelton, do you and I realize that God's new community is not a contract community, but it's a covenant community? I mean this. Usually contract is marked by self-preservation. As soon as it doesn't benefit me, I'm out. It's all about cost and benefit analysis. So if one part suffers, oh, good luck, I'm out of it. I don't want to suffer. That's a contract community marked by self-preservation. But what is church? It's a covenant community. What is community? Covenant community is marked by self-donation, not self-preservation. So when one suffers, we go with them, we sit with them, we cry with them, mourn with them. In their presence, we suffer together because we give ourselves away. That's God's new community marked by covenant self-donation. So when you join a gym today, it will say membership contract. That's what it says. But when you join a church, it's a membership covenant. Because we are saying we are all in this together. I give myself away for the flourishing of overall body. God's new community is self-donation. We give ourselves away. Do you and I realize that how this new community was formed? Do you know what was the apex of self-donation? You can find that at the cross of Jesus Christ. If Jesus was all about self-preservation, he would have come down from the cross. Why does he give himself away? But cross was completely marked by self-donation. He has willingly give, he gave himself away for the flourishing of overall body. Through Christ's blood, a new covenant has been formed. So we love God and love one another as Christ has loved us. That's the new covenant. That's the God's new community that he's calling us to be part of today. Chelton, do you know what Jesus has done for you? Jesus has given his one body away to make all of us one body in Christ. Church is worth giving your life to. Church takes preeminence because it's not just an organization, it's a living organism. Christ died for that, to make us alive in Him, to form us one body. And I need you, and you need me. I need you, and you need me in all that we are because we are in this together. We are God's new community. Let's pray. Oh God, we remember Jesus, how he has given himself away, marked by that utmost self-donation. Because of what Christ has done now, we are one body in him. Oh God, remind us this glorious reminder, glorious reality of what Christ has done when we sway, when we think as if we can live independently. Oh Lord, we look to Jesus Christ today for our hope and guidance. In your name we pray. Amen. What 
gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I So as you go, renewed in spirit, knowing that your sins, past, present, and future, are forgiven in Christ, and that you belong to something way bigger than yourselves. You belong to Christ and his body, and you participate in that body. So go to love and serve the Lord and to serve one another in the grace that God has given you. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 
Make his face to smile down on you. May the Lord be gracious to you. Turn his bright eyes to you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, life everlasting. Amen. Go in peace. Oh man, my legs are asleep.